Chapter 23, The Pawnbroker's Shop Of the numerous receptacles for misery and distress with which the streets of London unhappily abound, there are, perhaps, none which present such striking scenes as the pawnbroker's shops. The very nature and description of these places occasions their being but little known, except to the unfortunate beings whose profligacy or misfortune drives them to seek the temporary relief they offer. The subject may appear, at first sight, to be anything but an inviting one, but we venture on it nevertheless in the hope that, as far as the limits of our present paper are concerned, it will present nothing to disgust even the most fastidious reader. There are some pawnbroker's shops of a very superior description. There are grades in pawning as in everything else, and distinctions must be observed even in poverty. The aristocratic Spanish cloak and the plebeian calico shirt, the silver fork and the flat iron, the muslin cravat and the belcher neckerchief would but ill assort together. So, the better sort of pawnbroker calls himself a silversmith and decorates his shop with handsome trinkets and expensive jewelry, while the more humble moneylender boldly advertises his calling and invites observation. It is with pawnbroker's shops of the latter class that we have to do. We have selected one for our purpose, and will endeavor to describe it. The pawnbroker's shop is situated near Drury Lane, at the corner of a court, which affords a side entrance for the accommodation of such customers as may be desirous of avoiding the observation of passers-by, or the chance of recognition in the public street. It is a low, dirty-looking dusty shop, the door of which stands always doubtfully a little way open, half inviting half repelling the hesitating visitor who, if he be as yet uninitiated, examines one of the old garnet brooches in the window for a minute or two with affected eagerness, as if he contemplated making a purchase, and then looking cautiously round to ascertain that no one watches him, hastily slinks in, the door closing of itself after him to just its former width. The shop front and the window frames bear evident marks of having been once painted, but what the color was originally or at what date it was probably laid on, are at this remote period questions which may be asked, but cannot be answered. Tradition states that the transparency in the front door, which displays at night three red balls on a blue ground, once bore also, inscribed in graceful waves, the words, money advanced on plate, jewels, wearing apparel, and every description of property. But a few illegible hieroglyphics are all that now remain to attest the fact. The plate and jewels would seem to have disappeared, together with the announcement, for the articles of stock, which are displayed in some profusion in the window, do not include any very valuable luxuries of either kind. A few old china cups, some modern vases, adorned with paltry paintings of three Spanish cavaliers playing three Spanish guitars, or a party of boars carousing, each boar with one leg painfully elevated in the air, by way of expressing his perfect freedom and gaiety. Several sets of chessmen, two or three flutes, a few fiddles, a round-eyed portrait staring in astonishment from a very dark ground, some gaudily bound prayer books and testaments, two rows of silver watches quite as clumsy and almost as large as Ferguson's first, numerous old-fashioned table and teaspoons displayed fan-like in half-dozens, strings of coral with great broad gilt snaps, Cards of rings and brooches, fastened and labeled separately, like the insects in the British Museum. Cheap silver penholders and snuff boxes, with a Masonic star, complete the jewelry department. While five or six beds and smeary clouded ticks, strings of blankets and sheets, silk and cotton handkerchiefs, and wearing apparel of every description, form the more useful, though even less ornamental, part of the articles exposed for sale. An extensive collection of planes, chisels, saws, and other carpenter's tools, which have been pledged and never redeemed, form the foreground of the picture, while the large frames full of ticketed bundles, which are dimly seen through the dirty casement upstairs, the squalid neighborhood, the adjoining house straggling, shrunken, and rotten, with one or two filthy, unwholesome-looking heads thrust out of every window, and old red pans and stunted plants exposed on the tottering parapets, to the manifest hazard of the heads of the passers-by, the noisy men loitering under the archway at the corner of the court, 
or about the gin shop next door, and their wives patiently standing on the curbstone with large baskets of cheap vegetables slung round them for sale, are its immediate auxiliaries. If the outside of the pawnbroker's shop be calculated to attract the attention or excite the interest of the speculative pedestrian, its interior cannot fail to produce the same effect in an increased degree. The front door, which we have before noticed, opens into the common shop, which is the resort of all those customers whose habitual acquaintance with such scenes renders them indifferent to the observation of their companions in poverty. The side door opens into a small passage, from which some half-dozen doors, which may be secured on the inside by bolts, open into a corresponding number of little dens or closets, which face the counter. Here, the more timid or respectable portion of the crowd shroud themselves from the notice of the remainder, and patiently wait until the gentleman behind the counter, with the curly black hair, diamond ring, and double silver watch guard, shall feel disposed to favor them with his notice, a consummation which depends considerably on the temper of the aforesaid gentleman for the time being. At the present moment, this elegantly attired individual is in the act of entering the duplicate he has just made out in a thick book, a process from which he is diverted occasionally by a conversation he is carrying on with another young man similarly employed at a little distance from him, whose allusions to that last bottle of soda water last night, and how regularly round my hat he felt himself when the young woman gave him in charge, would appear to refer to the consequences of some stolen joviality of the preceding evening. The customers generally, however, seem unable to participate in the amusement derivable from this source, for an old sallow-looking woman, who has been leaning with both arms on the counter with a small bundle before her for half an hour previously, suddenly interrupts the conversation by addressing the jeweled shopman. Now, Mr. Henry, do my case, there's a good soul, for my two grandchildren's locked up at home, and I'm afeard of the fire. The shopman slightly raises his head with an air of deep abstraction and resumes his entry with as much deliberation as if he were engraving. You're in hurry, Mrs. Tatum, this evening, ain't you? Is the only notice he deigns to take, after the lapse of five minutes or so. Yes, I am indeed, Mr. Henry. Now, do serve me next, there's a good creature. I wouldn't be worrying you, only it's longer than bothering children. What have you got here? inquires the shopman, unpinning the bundle. Old concern, I suppose. A pair of stays and a petticoat. You must look up something else, old woman. I can't lend you anything more upon them. They're completely worn out by this time, if it's only by putting in and taking out again three times a week. Oh, you are rumming you are, replies the old woman, laughing extremely, as in duty bound. I wish I'd got the gift of the gab like you. See if I'd be up the spout so often then. No, no, it ain't the petticoat. It's a child's frock and a beautiful silk handkerchief, as it belongs to my husband. He gave four shillings for it the very same blessed day as he broke his arm. Where do you want upon these? inquires Mr. Henry, slightly glancing at the articles, which in all probability are old acquaintances. Where do you want upon these? Eighteen pence. Lend you nine pence. I'll make it a shilling, there's a dear. Do now. Not another farden. Well, I suppose I must take it. The duplicate is made out, one ticket pinned on the parcel, the other given to the old woman. The parcel is flung carelessly down into a corner, and some other customer prefers his claim to be served without further delay. The choice falls on an unshaven, dirty, sottish-looking fellow, whose tarnished paper cap, stuck negligently over one eye, communicates an additionally repulsive expression to his very uninviting countenance. He was enjoying a little relaxation from his sedentary pursuits a quarter of an hour ago in kicking his wife up the court. He has come to redeem some tools, probably to complete a job with, on account of which he has already received some money if his inflamed countenance and drunken staggers may be taken as evidence of the fact. Having waited some little time, he makes his presence known by venting his ill humor on a ragged urchin who, being unable to bring his face on a level of the counter by any other process, has employed himself in climbing up and then hooking himself on with his elbows. An uneasy perch, from which he has fallen at intervals, generally alighting on the toes of the person in his immediate vicinity. In the present case, the unfortunate little wretch has received a cuff which sends him reeling to this door, and the donor of the blow is immediately the object of general indignation. "'What do you strike the boy for, you old brute?' exclaims the slipshod woman, with two flat irons and a little basket. "'Do you think he's your wife, you willin'? 
Go and hang yourself, replies the gentleman addressed, with a drunken look of savage stupidity, aiming at the same time a blow at the woman, which fortunately misses its object. Go and hang yourself, and wait till I come and cut you down. Cut you down, rejoins the woman. I wish I had the cutting of you up, you wagabond, loud. Oh, you precious wagabond, rather louder. Where's your wife, you willin? Louder still. Women of this class are always sympathetic, and work themselves into a tremendous passion on the shortest notice. Your poor dear wife, as you uses worse than nor a dog. Strike a woman, you a man, very shrill. I wish I had you, I'd murder you, I would, if I died for it. Now be civil, retorts the man fiercely. Be civil, you wiper, ejaculates the woman contemptuously. Ain't it shocking, she continues, turning round, and appealing to an old woman who is peeping out of one of the little closets we have before described, and who has not the slightest objection to join in the attack, possessing, as she does, the comfortable conviction that she is bolted in. Ain't it shocking, ma'am? Dreadful, says the old woman in parentheses, not exactly knowing what the question refers to. He's got a wife, ma'am, as takes in mangling, and is as industrious and hard-working as a young woman as can be, very fast as lives in the back parlor of her house, which my husband and me lives in the front one, with great rapidity. And we hears him a-beatin' on her sometimes, when he comes home drunk the whole night through, and not only a-beatin' her, but beatin' his own child too, to make her more miserable. Oh, you beast! And she, poor creature, won't swear the peace again him, nor do nothing, because she likes the wretch all her all. Worse luck. Here the woman has completely run herself out of breath. The pawnbroker himself, who has just appeared behind the counter in a grey dressing gown, embraces the favorable opportunity of putting in a word. Now I won't have none of this sort of thing on my premises, he interposes with an air of authority. Mrs. Mackin, keep yourself to yourself, or you don't get fourpence for a flat iron ear. And Jenkins, you leave your ticket till you're sober, and send your wife for them two planes, for I won't have you in my shop at no price. So make yourself scarce before I make you scarcer. This eloquent address produces anything but the effect desired. The women rail in concert, the man hits about him in all directions, and is in the act of establishing an indisputable claim to gratuitous lodgings for the night, when the entrance of his wife, a wretched, worn-out woman, apparently in the last stage of consumption, whose face bears evident marks of recent ill-usage, and whose strength seems hardly equal to the burden, light enough, God knows, of the thin, sickly child she carries in her arms, turns his cowardly rage in a safer direction. "'Come home, dear,' cries the miserable creature in an imploring tone. "'Do come home, there's a good fellow, and go to bed.' "'Go home yourself,' rejoins the furious ruffian. "'Do come home quietly,' repeats the wife, bursting into tears. "'Go home yourself,' retorts the husband again, enforcing his argument by a blow which sends the poor creature flying out of the shop. Her natural protector follows her up the court, alternately venting his rage and accelerating her progress, and in knocking the little scanty blue bonnet of the unfortunate child over its still more scanty and faded-looking face. In the last box, which is situated in the darkest and most obscure corner of the shop, considerably removed from either of the gaslights, are a young, delicate girl of about twenty, and an elderly female, evidently her mother from the resemblance between them, who stand at some distance back, as if to avoid the observation even of the shopman. It is not their first visit to a pawnbroker's shop, for they answer without a moment's hesitation the usual questions, put in a rather respectful manner, and in a much lower tone than usual, of, What name shall I say? Your own property, of course. Where do you live? Housekeeper or lodger? They bargain, too, for a higher loan than the shopman is at first inclined to offer, which a perfect stranger would be little disposed to do. And the elder female urges her daughter on, in scarcely audible whispers, to exert her utmost powers of persuasion to obtain an advance of the sum and expatiate on the value of the articles they have brought to raise a present supply upon. They are a small gold chain and a forget-me-not ring, the girl's property, for they are both too small for the mother, given her in better times, prized perhaps once for the giver's sake, but parted with now without a struggle. For want has hardened the mother, and her example has hardened the girl and the prospect of receiving money, coupled with a recollection of the misery they have both endured from the want of it, the coldness of old friends, the stern refusal of some, and the still more galling compassion of others, appears to have obliterated the consciousness of self-humiliation which the idea of their present situation would once have aroused. In the next box is a young female, 
whose attire, miserably poor but extremely gaudy, wretchedly cold but extravagantly fine, too plainly bespeaks her station. The rich satin gown with its faded trimmings, the worn-out thin shoes and pink silk stockings, the summer bonnet in winter, and the sunken face, where a daub of rouge only serves as an index to the ravages of squandered health never to be regained, and lost happiness never to be restored, and where the practiced smile is a wretched mockery of the misery of the heart, cannot be mistaken. There is something in the glimpse she has just caught of her young neighbor, and in the sight of the little trinkets she has offered in pawn, that seems to have awakened in this woman's mind some slumbering recollection, and to have changed, for an instant, her whole demeanor. Her first hasty impulse was to bend forward as if to scan more minutely the appearance of her half-concealed companions. Her next, on seeing them involuntarily shrink from her, to retreat to the back of the box, cover her face with her hands, and burst into tears. There are strange chords in the human heart, which will lie dormant through years of depravity and wickedness, but which will vibrate at last to some slight circumstance, apparently trivial in itself, but connected by some undefined and indistinct association with past days that can never be recalled, and with bitter recollections from which the most degraded creature in existence cannot escape. There has been another spectator, in the person of a woman in the common shop, the lowest of the low, dirty, unbonneted, flaunting, and slovenly. Her curiosity was at first attracted by the little she could see of the group, then her attention. The half-intoxicated leer changed to an expression of something like interest, and a feeling similar to that we have described appeared for a moment, only for a moment, to extend itself even to her bosom. Who shall say how soon these women may change places? The last has but two more stages, the hospital and the grave. How many females, situated as her two companions are, and as she may have been once, have terminated the same wretched course in the same wretched manner? One is already tracing her footsteps with frightful rapidity. How soon may the other follow her example? How many have done the same? Chapter 24 Criminal Courts we shall never forget the mingled feelings of awe and respect with which we used to gaze on the exterior of Newgate in our schoolboy days. How dreadful its rough heavy walls and low massive doors appeared to us, the latter looking as if they were made for the express purpose of letting people in and never letting them out again. Then the fetters over the debtor's door, which we used to think were a bona fide set of irons, just hung up there for convenience sake ready to be taken down at a moment's notice, and riveted on the limbs of some refractory felon. We were never tired of wondering how the hackney coachman on the opposite stand could cut jokes in the presence of such horrors, and drink pots of half and half so near the last drop. Often have we strayed here, in session's time, to catch a glimpse of the whipping place, and that dark building on one side of the yard, in which is kept the gibbet with all its dreadful apparatus, and on the door of which, we half expected to see a brass plate with the inscription Mr. Ketch, for we never imagined that the distinguished functionary could by possibility live anywhere else. The days of these childish dreams have passed away, and with them many other boyish ideas of a gayer nature. But we still retain so much of our original feeling that to this hour we never pass the building without something like a shudder. What London pedestrian is there who has not, at some time or other, cast a hurried glance through the wicket at which the prisoners are admitted into this gloomy mansion, and surveyed the few objects he could discern with an indescribable feeling of curiosity. The thick door, plated with iron and mounted with spikes, just low enough to enable you to see, leaning over them an ill-looking fellow in a broad-brimmed hat, belcher handkerchief, and top boots, with a brown coat, something between a great coat and a sporting jacket on his back, and an immense key in his left hand. Perhaps you are lucky enough to pass, just as the gate is being opened. Then you see on the other side of the lodge another gate, the image of its predecessor, and two or three more turnkeys, who look like multiplications of the first one, seated round a fire which just lights up the whitewashed apartment sufficiently to enable you to catch a hasty glimpse of these different objects. We have a great respect for Mrs. Fry, but she certainly ought to have written more romances than Mrs. Radcliffe. 
We were walking leisurely down the Old Bailey some time ago, when, as we passed this identical gate, it was opened by the officiating turnkey. We turned quickly round, as a matter of course, and saw two persons descending the steps. We could not help stopping and observing them. They were an elderly woman of decent appearance, though evidently poor, and a boy of about fourteen or fifteen. The woman was crying bitterly. She carried a small bundle in her hand, and the boy followed at a short distance behind her. Their little history was obvious. The boy was her son, to whose early comfort she had perhaps sacrificed her own, for whose sake she had borne misery without repining and poverty without a murmur, looking steadily forward to the time when he who has so long witnessed her struggles for himself might be enabled to make some exertions for their joint support. He had formed dissolute connections. Idleness had led to crime, and he had been committed to take his trial for some petty theft. He had been long in prison, and, after receiving some trifling additional punishment, had been ordered to be discharged that morning. It was his first offense, and his poor old mother, still hoping to reclaim him, had been waiting at the gate to implore him to return home. We cannot forget the boy. He descended the steps with a dogged look, shaking his head with an air of bravado and obstinate determination. They walked a few paces and paused. The woman put her hand upon his shoulder in an agony of entreaty, and the boy sullenly raised his head as if in refusal. It was a brilliant morning, and every object looked fresh and happy in the broad, gay sunlight. He gazed round him for a few moments, bewildered with the brightness of the scene, for it was long since he had beheld anything save the gloomy walls of a prison. Perhaps the wretchedness of his mother made some impression on the boy's heart. Perhaps some undefined recollection of the time when he was a happy child and she his only friend and best companion crowded on him. He burst into tears, and covering his face with one hand and hurriedly placing the other in his mother's, walked away with her. Curiosity has occasionally led us into both courts at the Old Bailey. Nothing is so likely to strike the person who enters them for the first time as the calm indifference with which the proceedings are conducted. Every trial seems a mere matter of business. There is a great deal of form, but no compassion. Considerable interest, but no sympathy. Take the old court, for example. There sit the judges, with whose great dignity everybody is acquainted, and of whom, therefore, we need say no more. Then there is the Lord Mayor in the center, looking as cool as a Lord Mayor can look, with an immense bouquet before him, inhabited in all the splendor of his office. Then there are the sheriffs, who are almost as dignified as the Lord Mayor himself, and the barristers, who are quite dignified enough in their own opinion, and the spectators, who, having paid for their admission, look upon the whole scene as if it were got up especially for their amusement. Look upon the whole group in the body of the court, some wholly engrossed in the morning papers, others carelessly conversing in low whispers, and others, again, quietly dozing away an hour and you can scarcely believe that the result of the trial is a matter of life or death to one wretched being present. But turn your eyes to the dock, watch the prisoner attentively for a few moments, and the fact is before you in all its painful reality. Mark how restlessly he has been engaged for the last ten minutes in forming all sorts of fantastic figures with the herbs which are strewed upon the ledge before him. Observe the ashy paleness of his face when a particular witness appears, and how he changes his position and wipes his clammy forehead and feverish hands when the case for the prosecution is closed, as if it were a relief to him to feel that the jury knew the worst. The defense is concluded. The judge proceeds to sum up the evidence, and the prisoner watches the countenances of the jury as a dying man, clinging to life to the very last, vainly looks in the face of his physicians for a slight ray of hope. They turn around to consult, you can almost hear the man's heart beat as he bites the stalk of rosemary, with a desperate effort to appear composed. They resume their places. A dead silence prevails as the foreman delivers in the verdict, Guilty! A shriek bursts from a female in the gallery. The prisoner casts one look at the quarter from whence the noise proceeded, and is immediately hurried from the dock by the jailer. The clerk directs one of the officers of the court to take the woman out, and fresh business is proceeded with, as if nothing had occurred. No imaginary contrast to a case like this could be as complete as that which is constantly presented in the new court, the gravity of which is frequently disturbed in no small degree by the cunning and pertinacity 
of juvenile offenders. A boy of 13 is tried, save for picking the pocket of some subject of Her Majesty, and the offense is about as clearly proved as an offense can be. He is called upon for his defense and contents himself with little declamation about the jurymen in his country, asserts that all the witnesses have committed perjury, and hints that the police force generally have entered into a conspiracy against him. However probable the statement may be, it fails to convince the court, and some such scene as the following then takes place. Court. Have you any witnesses to speak your character, boy? Boy. Yes, my lord. Fifteen gentlemen is a vaitin' outside, and was a vaitin' all day yesterday, which they told me the night before my trial was a coming on. Court. Inquire for these witnesses. Here, a stout beetle runs out and vociferates for the witnesses at the very top of his voice. For you can hear his cry grow fainter and fainter as he descends the steps into the courtyard below. After an absence of five minutes, he returns, very warm and hoarse, and informs the court of what it knew perfectly well before, namely, that there are no such witnesses in attendance. Hereupon, the boy sets up a most awful howling, screws the lower part of the palms of his hands into the corners of his eyes, and endeavors to look the picture of injured innocence. The jury at once find him guilty, and his endeavors to squeeze out a tear or two are redoubled. The governor of the jail then states, in reply to an inquiry from the bench, that the prisoner has been under his care twice before. This the urchin resolutely denies in some such terms as, Say out me, gentlemen, I never was in trouble afore. Indeed, my lord, I never was. It's all a owing to my having twin brother, which has wrongfully got into trouble, and which is so exactly like me, that no one ever knows the difference atween us. This representation, like the defense, fails in producing the desired effect, and the boy is sentenced, perhaps, to seven years' transportation. Finding it impossible to excite compassion, he gives vent to his feelings in an appreciation bearing reference to the eyes of the big old vig, and as he declines to take the trouble of walking from the dock, is forthwith carried out, congratulating himself on having succeeded in giving everybody as much trouble as possible.